Good morning, I'm Jonathan Himmelfarb. I'm the director of the Kidney Research Institute and co-director of the Center for Dialysis Innovation at the University of Washington. And this morning, I'll be talking to you about the landscape of dialysis innovation. And I'll try to cover in the next 20 minutes the epidemiology of kidney failure around the world and what the unmet needs are, discuss how we measure dialysis quality and probably more importantly, what we can do to try to improve dialysis quality, cover the changing societal landscapes that are really beginning to support innovation in this field, and briefly describe the technological innovation that's underway. And certainly you'll be hearing more throughout the next two days about the many technologies that are being developed today. I'll start by reviewing some of the epidemiology from a global perspective. Uh, these are data in the uh, International Society of Nephrology's Global Kidney Health Atlas published last year in 2019. And we'll be hearing more in a panel discussion from Amino Bello and others who were involved in creating this atlas. But you can see from this density heat map that the, ma the majority of kidney replacement therapy takes place in North America, in Western Europe, along the Pacific Rim, and in parts of Latin America. This doesn't necessarily reflect the incidence or prevalence of kidney failure around the world, but this is treated kidney failure. And indeed, Vivek Jha, who will also be uh, speaking later on today, published this paper a few years back, showing a very clear-cut relationship between a country's purchasing power and the use of kidney replacement therapies. Now, this plays out such that, unfortunately, the majority of the people in the world who develop kidney failure don't receive therapy today. These, again, are data from the Global Kidney Health Atlas, and you can see that back in 2010, there were about 2.6 million people around the globe treated for kidney failure, whether by transplantation or by dialysis, but there were 9.7 million people with kidney failure. So the majority of people were not treated. We've increased availability of treatment so that today it's probably around 3.6 to 3.8 million people being treated worldwide, and those numbers are anticipated to increase to 5.8 4 million in the next decade, but even that will be well short of the growing population around the world that's developing kidney failure. And you can see over here on the right that unfortunately, certainly in low income countries, but even in low middle income, upper middle income, and some high income countries, re kidney replacement therapy simply is not available to people. These are data from the United States and largely from the United States renal data system that were just uh, published a couple of weeks ago. And you see in the upper left-hand corner here, incident kidney failure treatment in the United States. And there are a couple of things here that are of note. First off, the use of preemptive transplantation or home dialysis in the form of peritoneal dialysis is very unusual with incident patients. So the vast majority of incident patients with kidney failure start off on in-center hemodialysis. You can also see, which is important, a leveling off of the incidence of kidney failure in the US in recent years. However, when we look at prevalence data, we see that there's this inexorable rise and that over time, more people have been transplanted or are in home dialysis. Uh, and also people are living longer with both transplantation and with dialysis. These bottom two figures are the home dialysis population. And while it's relatively small, you can see that incident uh, use of home dialysis is growing appreciably over the last decade, and it's almost entirely due to peritoneal dialysis. And that's reflected by increased prevalence of home dialysis in the United States as well. Now, we know that the kidneys uh, are amazing organs, really, in terms of maintaining homeostasis in the body, removing toxins from the body, keeping uh, the environment constant for every organ and cell in the body to function optimally. So kidney failure is associated with a substantial burden, symptom burden, for individuals and for population health. It's an expensive disease. There are high rates of hospitalization, frequent care transitions, there's a lot of disability associated with kidney diseases and a high pill burden and lots of medication costs as well. There are complications from access and major lifestyle changes 
that are associated with treated kidney failure. From the outset, back in the 1960s, we understood the symptoms that were associated with uremia and people were searching for ways to measure dialysis adequacy. And back in those pioneering days in the 1960s, the focus really was on manifestations of uremia, whether that was hypertension or all the associated symptoms. And the goal was established as rehabilitation, i.e. allowing people to live their lives the way they would like to live them as if they didn't have kidney disease. As soon as the 1970s, there was a desire for quality measures to be more quantitative and quote unquote objective and various biochemical measures were developed and physiologic measures like nerve conduction velocity. But rapidly, we moved to the measurement both in the blood and by clearance in dialysis of so-called uremic toxins. And the field eventually really settled on measurement of urea and removal of urea as the primary measure of dialysis adequacy. And back in the 1970s, we developed elegant formulae, back really from the 70s through the 90s, uh, for measuring clearance of urea. And we assumed that it was a surrogate toxin, that if we remove more urea, patients would feel better. And I think people were comforted by these equations uh, that were quite elegant, mass balance uh, equations that could calculate the amount of uh, urea that was generated every day and that was uh, uh, reduced every day uh, that one received uh, dialysis treatment. The problem, though, in the late 1990s and 2000s uh, became that we recognized that uh, the amount of urea that you removed had very little to do with uh, how patients fared on dialysis. And the chemo study was a seminal study uh, where uh, patients were randomized to clearance of more middle molecules by high flux membranes or more urea clearance, and there was absolutely no difference in the outcomes uh, for patients. And I, I would say that after that, we began questioning some of the assumptions that we made about biochemical measures being the be all and end all to measure how our patients were doing with dialysis. And we now recognize that uh, patients that are receiving dialysis therapy continue to have a very high burden of resi residual symptoms. Really doesn't matter where you live or what form of dialysis you're getting, it's true. Uh, that while uh, dialysis clearly improves some symptoms, there's quite a few remaining symptoms that patients experience. And this has led to a number of recent initiatives to really redefine what we mean by adequacy and quality and what we're trying to achieve with dialysis. Last year at the IDEAS meeting, Allison Tong, the leader of the SONG initiative, which is developing standardized outcomes, uh, for clinical trials, for therapeutics in kidney diseases, gave a great talk. These are some of the data from uh, the SONG initiative in hemodialysis, showing what do patients really care about and their caregivers. Fatigue, energy, resilience, ability to travel, dialysis free time. They don't really care about parathyroid hormone concentration or even mortality so much. So what patients really want is to be able to live their lives as if they were free from disease to the extent possible. And a further study that came out of the SONG initiative shows the disconnect between what patients care about and what health professionals care about. So again, patients care about ability to travel, dialysis free time, not feeling washed out, mobility, the ability to live your life the way you would like to live your life, and they care about hospitalization and, and mortality, but less so than the ability uh, to feel good. Jenny Fleith, who will also be talking during this meeting, led an effort from the Kidney Health Initiative to similarly quantify and prioritize symptoms that patients care about the most. And after an extensive process, they prioritized both physical and mood symptoms insomnia, fatigue, and cramps as physical symptoms, anxiety, depression, and frustration as mood symptoms that patients care about. So perhaps if we're trying to improve dialysis, these are the kinds of symptoms we should be focused on as opposed to biochemical variables or parameters. In a sense, this is going back to the future because the pioneers in the 1960s 
all believed the goal of treatment was make people feel well enough as if they didn't have disease so they could be fully rehabilitated. And Belding Scribner, one of the early pioneers uh, back in Seattle here in the 1960s, in 1963, three years after the first patient went on chronic hemodialysis said, if the treatment of chronic uremia cannot fully rehabilitate the patient, the treatment is inadequate. By those standards, our treatments today are still inadequate. So what would rehabilitation look like? Well, this is a picture of Bill Peckham, perhaps uh, one of the, one is certainly one of the most uh, well-known and inspiring dialysis patients who unfortunately passed away last year. Bill Peckham lived here in Seattle where he self-dialyzed at home for almost 30 years, dialyzed himself in over 30 countries, he had a blog for patients called From the Sharp End of the Needle. And this is a picture of Bill dialyzing himself while rafting down the Grand Canyon. So rehabilitation would look like Bill does here, but without all of the equipment that it took uh, and the six weeks of preparation that it took to organize this trip. Why is it that our patients don't feel as if they're fully rehabilitated uh, as if they still have residual kidney disease and residual symptomatology. Well, certainly part of the reason is that kidneys work 24 seven and dialysis is discontinuous. And the primary function of healthy, well-functioning kidneys is to maintain constancy. Homeostasis means constancy in the blood. So keep the toxin levels constantly low in the blood keep the salt and water content at a steady state, keep electrolyte homeostasis, acid-base homeostasis constant. And when we deliver discontinuous therapy, there are abrupt changes in the concentrations of electrolytes or acid-base in the amount of salt and water in the body and the concentrations of the uremic toxins. And that's inherently unphysiologic. So we've known for a long time that the more frequently one receives dialysis and the longer the treatments, the closer you come to continuous therapy, the better patients feel. But with current day dialysis, you end up trading the burden of the disease for the burden of the treatment if you are sedentary, tied to a machine, plugged into a wall to be getting your treatment. This is not a new concept, and Willem Kolf, one of the other pi uh, pioneers, true pioneers in the 1940s of dialysis, back in 1975, published diagrams uh, for the idea of portable and wearable forms of hemodialysis. And he not only published papers, but he built devices. So the 1970s was really an era for uh, early pioneers and innovators in devices, whether it was the first insulin pump built by Dean Kamen, who spoke at Ideas Conference last year, whether it was LVADs, as we heard uh, also in presentations last year, but also uh, Willem Kolf developed a wearable kidney and took people rafting down the Grand Canyon in the 70s, but he could never solve the dialysate problem, meaning that the amount of dialysate, both the weight of it and the volume of it, precluded any kind of portable, true portable or wearable treatment. And after the 70s, in the dialysis field, this kind of device innovation lay relatively stagnant for an extended period of time. Now the landscape around us is changing rapidly and hopefully providing a completely different environment where that stagnation will not take place because at least in the United States, and I do believe it's global, uh, federal agencies are collaborating to accelerate in innovation through public-private partnerships Last year, we heard presentations of the technology roadmap from the Kidney Health Initiative at this meeting, which was very exciting to see in, in print uh, a roadmap from a device performance standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, and even perhaps from a reimbursement standpoint for how to support true innovation that would be transformative. And then there is a synergy with the Kidney Innovation Accelerator or a Kidney X Initiative coming from Health and Human Services. Both of these efforts are in partnership with the American Society of Nephrology. Kidney X has awarded phase two prizes to redesign dialysis. And a very exciting component of this meeting will be the recent phase two Kidney X prize winners giving presentations on their innovations. 
Another exciting development in the last 12 months was the executive order for advancing American kidney health, which set a very high bar, a challenge to our community to completely transform the experience for patients. To first of all, reduce the number of Americans who develop end-stage kidney disease by 25% by 2030, but for those that do develop kidney failure, to double the number of kidneys available for transplant and to aim to have 80% of, of people home by 2025 who are receiving dialysis. Really uh, uh, stretch goals, if you will, but incredibly important to see this coming out of the federal government. Oops, wrong direction. So a lot, there is a lot of ferment now, there's a lot of activity. We saw a lot of this last year and we'll hear much more during this meeting. What we understand is that in this changing environment, it's patients' priorities that count the most. And if we don't have patients at the table, as we will during this meeting, uh, in designing dialysis of the future or kidney replacement therapies in the future, we won't be going about it in the right way. The goals are becoming clear through activities like the Kidney Health Initiative Roadmap for what innovative dialysis devices could really do that would be transformative. And to get from here to there, we need both top-down efforts by government agencies to support uh, changes uh, in regulatory aspects uh, that will catalyze innovation, reimbursement, policy considerations. But very importantly, we need bottom-up efforts by patient advocates, researchers, and innovators that are really going to change the future for patients with kidney failure. Now, someday we will hopefully go to portable dialysis, and someday we'll go from portable dialysis to bioengineered kidneys and implantable uh, kidneys and implantable forms of uh, dialysis. And the roadmap exists. We know the kinds of technologies that people are working on. The timetables will vary, uh, but there's real hope for the future for people uh, living with kidney disease now if they do develop kidney failure. And I'll end uh, this uh, brief overview of the landscape of dialysis innovation by saying that really I do believe that after decades of relative technologic stagnation, change is underway and it's very exciting. We'd like to, whatever we can do with the ideas meeting to catalyze that change, uh, we will do going forward. And now there's growing momentum from patients, nephrologists, payers, regulators, and governments to support transformative innovation. And we know what the challenges are. We know that for dialysis technology, it has to become greener, smaller, more affordable around the world, use less water, be more continuous, and the goal has to be true re rehabilitation. We have to go back to the future and think like the pioneers did in the 1960s. And truly, it's our collective community responsibility to make that change happen for the simple reason that our patients deserve better options and they deserve hope for the future. And as Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Thank you for your attention.